to John and Paul for the invitation and uh, uh, Francesco and Matt for uh, organizing such a wonderful uh, conference. Um, and greetings from Chicago. Acknowledgements to David Maldonado, our fellow who helped me uh, with this uh, presentation. Uh, as a uh, Canadian born and raised, I am part of the uh, invasion of uh, the United States uh, by Canada. Um, so it's good to be uh, here in uh, my home country and I have a little bit of uh, free advice for you uh, since we are in, uh, in Canada. And enjoy that, Paul. <laughs> uh, uh, other uh, disclosures, tongue in cheek a little bit. My, I have a bias uh, because of uh, my practice being very inclined towards sports medicine, and a big part of my life is uh, spent doing arthroscopic surgery uh, of the hip on uh, people like this. Uh, and this makes me think in terms of uh, patient uh, function uh, uh, rather than survivorship in a lot of cases. So uh, we rely very heavily on the forgotten joint score in evaluating. Uh, our outcomes and uh, think in terms of a high functioning uh, population of patients who tend to be uh, on the younger side as well. Uh, so in considering dual mobility, I'll talk about why, how, and when. Fairly simple. So why? Uh, a couple things on the design concept. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a dual mobility, but there are actually three articulations, uh, and this is important to internalize. Uh, there's the uh, uh, articulation between the liner and the shell, uh, the articulation between the head and the liner. There's also an articulation between the neck and the liner that's easy uh, to forget about. And uh, indeed, I think it was sort of forgotten about in some of the early uh, designs where you saw without considering the third articulation, you could get uh, polys like this. Um, so as the design concepts evolved, uh, some very smart engineers thought about uh, this articulation and avoided coupling uh, the dual mobility concept with unpolished or irregular necks. Uh, Another thing to internalize is this 80-20 concept. So 80% of the motion is between uh, the head and the liner at the A1 articulation. Only 20% is at the A2 articulation. Uh, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the wear thinking uh, uh, comes from understanding that 80-20 concept. Model, modern double mobility liners uh, have smooth angles uh, to avoid conflicts with the soft tissue on the outer surface and chamfered edges on the inner surface to optimize the neck liner contact uh, as well as high retention uh, strength. And this is what you'll see with uh, Medacta's uh, liners. So important slide, the benefits uh, or potential benefits of double mobility. Uh, first of all, low wear rate. Uh, double mobility uh, and uh, the third articulation uh, with the high cross technology uh, has had very low rate. I'll, I'll discuss, uh, discuss that shortly. Uh, reduced risk of dislocation. You have data that shows 0.1% uh, dislocation rates. Uh, high range of motion. Clearly the liner size is the effective head diameter, which is a, gives you a very big head neck ratio. And you have 40 years of clinical uh, history. So in terms of the uh, wear rates, uh, this is data from uh, Medacta for the VersaFit. Uh, very low wear rate, comparable to hard-on-hard -hard bearings, 94% wear reduction with a high cross compared to uh, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, fixed bearing uh, cups, in terms of the dislocation risk, fixed, bear fixed bearing cups, uh, the effective head diameter is the femoral head diameter, whereas with dual mobility, the effective head diameter is the liner diameter. So clearly you're having a dramatic uh, increase in the head to neck ratio. So does that really make a difference in the range of motion? Uh, here you see a, a comparison uh, between the dual mobility and uh, the standard uh, mobility uh, implants. And particularly what draws my attention is in uh, rotation. You have 216 degrees of arc of rotation compared to even with a 36 millimeter head, uh, 180 uh, degrees. So a, a substantial increase in the rotational profile. And does it really work? Does it continue to function as dual mobility? So explant studies uh, have shown that it does continue to function as uh, DM, unlike bipolar hem hemiarthroplasties. So it doesn't lock up uh, in the same way as a bipolar. This was first proposed in 1976. So this is not a new concept. Uh, it's an old concept. And I think it has improved a lot uh, with time. Uh, even the early uh, studies showed 95% survival at 10 years uh, with the, the first generation. And uh, again, a 0.1% uh, dislocation rate. And subsequent studies uh, have looked at follow-ups uh, uh, greater than five years and found 100% survival rate and 0% uh, dislocations. So, how? Dual mobility, how? Uh, my partner Chris Alden will talk about the uh, high cross technology in a subsequent talk, so I won't belabor it, but uh, I'm, I'm a fan. 
Uh, the jumping distance uh, is clearly relevant, and if you look at the jumping distance uh, for the VersaFit cup with its five uh, degree elevation on the left, uh, compared to uh, other cups, you see a, a reduction in the jumping distance as you take away that elevation. Uh, so a, a clear advantage there. Uh, two uh, products that are in use with Medacta, the VersaFit uh, DM, I've used both of these. Uh, this is an elliptical press fit. Uh, with uh, HA-coded equatorial uh, microstructures and a five degree elevation. Uh, the impact uh, DM, which uh, I favor now because of uh, better ability to control the rotation uh, with uh, the instrumentation. This is a hemispherical press fit cup with the Mecta grip porous coating, again a five degree raise and 10 degree uh, grooves on the rim. Uh, this Mecta grip uh, it really gives you optimal primary and secondary uh, stability, and you'll feel this when you impact it. It's a very uh, solid fit. So what about when? In what patients uh, should we use this? First of all, probably the case that was presented. Uh, that's a, a great case that encompasses uh, some of the whens uh, in this little uh, slide. Uh, so there are some specific populations uh, that may be in need, that may be at increased risk uh, for instability. One is uh, those with a stiff spine, uh, with or without a lumbar fusion. Clearly, this becomes a very different patient uh, than somebody who has a more flexible spine. Femoral neck fractures, these patients uh, may be at increased risk uh, for dislocation. Uh, high demand patients, we've all had these uh, patients who uh, do yoga or other uh, activities uh, that require a uh, significant range of motion uh, of the hip, and that may be somebody in whom we should consider uh, dual mobility. Uh, ligamentous laxity patients, uh, I've uh, written a, a number of articles on uh, hip problems in patients with ligamentous laxity syndromes, and as a result, they uh, make up a, a nice little sliver of my practice, uh, and I think these are a, a population that's clearly at risk. Uh, and then, of course, revision uh, total hip replacements. So. I, I would propose that we might think even a step beyond this, uh, beyond the uh, populations in need, those specific populations, why not do a primary THR every time uh, with dual mobility? I, I think that is really the, the burden of proof that's upon us, and uh, maybe we'll want to think big and uh, ask ourselves why not. Uh, so again, to review the dual mobility benefits, uh, low wear rate, Reduced risk of dislocation, very low, 0.1% uh, has been published. High range of motion because the liner size is the effective head uh, diameter and 40 years of uh, clinical history, all of which I think make a very compelling argument for a dual mobility uh, implant in this patient and perhaps in uh, many more of our patients. Thank you very much.